I'm one of those people who was able to uh, see the other side because literally I, I died. And the experience of, of, of having had an encounter with, with, with God and, and uh, uh, with the heavenly host in heaven and then told that I couldn't stay because there, were work, there was work for me to do here made me cry when I had to return back to my body. That's why I tell Denise, Denise, if, if I should die, if I, if I, if, if I should die, if I, if I should get hurt real bad, I don't want you to go through a whole bunch of extracurricular activities of trying to sustain me because I, I, I know in my heart that it's better where I have seen than where I am right now. You won't understand that until I talk a little bit more deeper about that. But we'll get into that just a little bit later. But what I do want to talk about today is, is it's pertinent is get a fix on your heart. Establish your heart firmly on the word. And how to get that fixed heart and how to establish that heart firmly on God's word. See, that's what I want to talk about this morning. See, there are a lot of things that, that are happening this day and age and people become depressed and uh, they, they, their faith is being tried and, and all these things. But you know, I found out one thing that's very, very true. When I'm really emotionally involved in something and I'm tribulating with it, it's only because I've turned my back on God. Did you hear what I said? For whatever reason, I allowed that circumstance in my life to become a Goliath, a, a grandiose thing that it's no different than Goliath standing down there saying it doesn't pay to serve the living God and all the blasphemes that came out of his mouth. But I have found in life that God is truly faithful. He's really, 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 really faithful. Yes. Yes. See, God will, will honor what he says and what he does and and God has a way of intervening into our lives in such a way that when your heart is broken God can fix it Amen. now that fix it part you know there's a part that we play in that and that is becoming a willing subject right. yes. see you'll never you'll never have a heart that's fixed until you have developed a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You will never get revelation as to how to live your life. You'll never get that wisdom of how to live this life except that you be in God and that you be in Jesus and that you be involved in relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, you can't get any revelation outside of God. And how many of you know that's what we need to know? We need wisdom. Lord, how do I live this life? How am I supposed to respond? Lord, especially since I'm an emotional creature. Mankind has always been emotional, hasn't he? And that's been our downfall because God has wanted us to control that side of our, of our character by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So, but see, I believe that we can have the things of God. And I believe that the Bible substantiates that fact in Matthew 6, 33, where it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which means his right way of doing things. And all these things shall be added unto you or given to you. I also believe that as a Christian today, we can have the power of God working in our life even now. I'm not talking about tomorrow, I'm talking about having it in your life right now. It comes from having, getting a fixed heart. Jesus said in John 15, 7, if you abide, and that word abide means that, means to, to be by, stand by, be established, be firm, to abide, to dwell there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you 
will, and it shall be done unto you or for you. But the criteria that we need, we need not ever forget what the criteria is, and the criteria is that we must have established fixed heart. I need a heart operation. There are times that we need a heart operation. There's a time that we need to go in and, and, and cut out those things that are not, that are not good, that are not uh, beneficial to our Christian walk, amen? Amen. amen? So we must have an established heart in the word and we must trust in the Lord to always be faithful as is his character to be that way, amen? amen. So Psalms 112 verse one and verse six and verse 7 and verse 8, Psalms 112, it says this, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his or God's commandments. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Verse 7, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Notice it didn't say trusting in his own ability. Notice it didn't say trusting uh, uh, in somebody else. It said trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. See, you've got to be in relationship. And you've got to be in relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God made it. God, God uh, caused it to be that way. So let me draw your focus a little closer in. Look at the, the word. His heart is fixed. Trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. These are three criteria to having a fixed heart. Your heart must be fixed. Trusting in the Lord too. His heart, your heart must be established. See, many people try to understand the word of God with their minds. How many of you know your mind? Your mind how can you understand the things that are spiritual with, with a natural mind. And a natural mind is, is normally in its fallen state. How can you understand? How can you fathom? How can, see, revelation, again, comes from uh, being in relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? But many people try to believe the word of God with their minds, and that's because their heart is not established. It's not fixed. So what do you mean? They want to do for themselves what the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Say, oh me. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Ouch or something. <laughs> See, the Holy Spirit's job is to be a comforter, a counselor. Counsels you on the word as you read the word. And it reveals the understanding of the word, whether it's written or by word of knowledge or, or word of wisdom. In John 16, 13, and 15, Jesus said in reference to the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of truth comes, he, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare, reveal to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare, reveal it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare, reveal it to you. I want to talk about a man called Elisha. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8 through 18, Here we find in verse number eight, within that chapter, the beginning of where the king had called his men together and planned his war against Israel. And obviously Israel was not doing so well in that war because they were, the king and his army was hiding. And so the king of Syria would say, well, we're going to go into Israel in this place or that place, and we're going to encamp there, make our camp, and then we're going to wage war. Uh, we're going to go in a raid there and, and, and wage war against Israel. 
The problem with that is that God had a plan. And it's the same way with your own individual life. God has a plan for your life. You are not just here happenstance. You're not just living this life for the sake of living this life. God has a plan for your life. That's why he has called the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of you to you so that you would know what your purpose and plan is in this life and how to walk it. That's the wisdom that God gives. Well, as the story goes, Elisha, and you have to say that it was by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit came to him and told him, look, Syria is going to be coming down and they're going to be camping over here. Go to the king of Israel and tell him, go camp over there. See, Israel was not on the offensive, they were on the defensive. And the word says that repeatedly, the king, uh, 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 Elisha had came and told the king the same thing. They're going to be over here. I want you to go over there. Where do you think he was getting this input in his life that was telling a man uh, where to go with his army? Where do you think it was coming? See, Elijah had something that some people, uh, 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 I mean, I want to say it this way, that everybody really wants to have. And you know what that is? A relationship. And a relationship with God in such an intimate way that God would declare what it is that he wants to do in your life and in the life of others. Here's Elisha who's become a deliverer of the children of Israel by words of knowledge and words of wisdom. Here's Elisha, the prophet, whom God has blessed to have ears to hear. And how did he get it? He got it by being sensitive. Look at your neighbor and say, being sensitive. Sensitive to hear the Holy Spirit. See, there's a point in time, I know he, that Elisha did this. He, he, he would have to still away and he'd get away from the noise. Sometimes you've got to get away from the noise. All those things that block us having the ability to hear spiritually what God is saying to our lives, for our lives, and for our betterment. Well, the word tells us that, that he would go and tell him, and finally the king of Syria got so agitated that he thought he had a spy in the midst of them. And so he called his men together and he says, which of you are a spy in our midst? And one of the men raised his hand and said, there's no spies amongst us. It's the prophet Elisha. And we understand that the scripture tells us that this Syrian king raised up a great army of chariots and, and uh, horsemen and, and uh, sent them down looking for Elisha so that they could kill him. Well, the story goes, Elisha being a praying man, a man who has confidence. See, when, you have, when you're fixed in your heart, you have a confidence that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. Now, that's the only way to be able to explain the, uh, the assurance, that confidence that comes when you have been in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God's word says this, I believe it, I'm going to stand on that. Well, they came and they looked for him. One morning he got up and he walked outside of his, uh, I, I want to say his tent, and he looked around and almost nonchalantly he said, oh, look it out there. And his servant said, now what are we going to do? And I should have said, ah. Oh. There's more out there for us than there are against us. And he looked out and God opened his eyes and he could see chariots of, of fire, men on horses and chariots of fire, angels coming and camped around the Syrian army to the extent that they surrounded them. Well, the story goes that, that uh, they came up to Elisha and Elisha said, blind him. Blind him. Lord, just blind him. And God did just that. The word continues later on in verse 18 where it says that they never came back again. They never came back to Israel again. So why, why are you saying all this? 
We need intervention into our life, and it only comes by having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, I, I, you know, I can't emphasize that a, a, enough. See, the Holy Spirit, I, I think we don't think that, that it's much, but it's a person. It's part of the Trinity. And I really believe that the Holy Spirit has feelings and emotions and can identify with our infirmities. God has sent him specifically for a specific task, and that is to communicate with us, to help us to, be, to understand the word of God, to help us how to live out the word of God, to tell us the wisdom of the how-to, as Gary was speaking last week. See, the Holy Spirit is an advocate. It understands God's word, and so it tells us what God is saying. And it tells us God's purpose and plan. The Holy Spirit is a counselor to the word to assist our understanding of the word. See, it reveals wisdom. Look at your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit gives me wisdom. And knowledge of God's plan for my life. See, God's plan in, in, uh, for Elisha was to be a deliverer, and God's plan for Israel was to be a, de a delivered nation set free. Now, how do I get and maintain my heart fix? How do I get it, and how do I, how do I maintain it? In order to receive what God has said in his word, it takes revelation by means of the Holy Spirit. You keep on praying. Lord, what is it? you want me to know today? What is it, Lord, that you want me to know today? And then get quiet and let the Holy Spirit speak a little bit. Some people pray and never give a breath to understand that you're having a conversation. Give the other person a chance to speak. Amen. <laughs> the Holy Spirit wants to speak, so you have to get quiet sometimes. Even, that's, that's even out of respect, amen? Yeah. Amen. amen. So it takes becoming sensitive to the Holy Spirit, developing and maintaining a relationship with the Holy Spirit because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. See, it takes being grounded and rooted in faith because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. It takes trusting God in faith when you cannot see a way out because man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. Yes. We are told in the word of God to study to show ourselves approved. And what does that approval mean? You mean to be approved by God? Uh, I think it's, the, it's to be approved that you can work the things that, that Jesus said, I go away but, but greater things you shall do because I go away. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? See, we need to know this about a fixed heart. God exalted his word above his name. So in order to live and operate like God does, the word must be first place in your heart. Amen. In my heart. Amen? Amen? See, we need to emulate. We need to, we need to copy. We need to uh, uh, consider the character of God as being good and we need to walk in it and act in it just like he did, just like Jesus Christ did. John 8, 31 says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me, in other words, if you are fixed in me, if you are established in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done for you. You get a heart fix from the revelation obtained from the word. You maintain it through continuous fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's what we do as Christians. Amen? Amen. I know that this, some of this is basic. There are two things we need to know. To get a heart fix, we, we, we must read and meditate. Yeah. Read and meditate. Read and meditate. Ponder the word. Ponder. What does that mean? Holy Spirit, what is it that you want me to, to know today? And then two, uh, 
To make Jesus Lord is to make the word the final authority. See, the word has to be the final authority in your life. Not, you know, a lot of people say, well, the number one authority in my life is me. Well, like, like, like Dr. Phil asked, how's that working for you? <laughs> See, as preachers, we get, chance to, we get chance to counsel a lot, and we get chance to hear all the bad news, you know? So, and some people can be very stubborn. <laughs> Lord, why do I have to say that? <laughs> Let me make a statement. If a believer wants to get God involved in their life, they must do what the word of God says. If you want God in your life, you've got to do what the word of God says. Why? Because faith without works is what? Dead. Is what? Dead. So, why... Does the, rule, the, the word ruled mind respond the way that it does? In, in, in a positive way, in a, in a powerful way, in a word way. It's because it's never prepared to fail. It's never ever prepared to fail. There isn't, there isn't any avenue for, give, for giving up. Why? Because they're believing God to be faithful to do what he has said and will do. Now, in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11, basically it's talking about that the word of God is, is so powerful that it will go and do the thing that God has purposed it to do. You should be smart enough to understand that if you use the word of God, it will also work for you because you are in the family, the lineage of God. You are children born again, born into the family of God. Jesus Christ has laid away. It's not, oh, me anymore. It's, it's me, God. Me and God, I'm no longer alone. I have now stepped to a place where I'm placed in right standing with God. And the same with you, amen? amen. James 1, 5 through 8 says, if any of you lacks wisdom or the know-how, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not purpose or think that they will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Which brings me to the point that I want to make. We can ask God for things. We're entitled to those things. We're not begging when we ask our father. Do you beg when you ask your earthly father or your er earthly mother for something? We don't beg. We're entitled. Somebody say amen. amen. I can't express to you enough about the lineage of who we are in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus has done. Now, I want to talk a little bit about my having died. I was 12 years old came from a very, very large family, very large, poor, black family. Uh, we had enough brothers. Somebody said, oh, you're black? I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I am? Man, there goes my day, man. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> But I was 12 years old, and we, I had enough brothers where we almost had a football team, honest to God. There were nine boys, and we'd get our sisters out there, they'd play ba basketball and football with us. They were just as rough as we were. You hear what I'm saying? I had five sisters, nine brothers. <laughs> and so we would get out and play football, and I was up at Vanderveer Park, where they used to have these, these uh, wooden uh, uh, park benches with cement uh, supports. And uh, I, was, I was always one of the running backs for, for the family. We, you know, the big ones would do the blocking and us little ones would do the running, you know? So I'm running with the ball and I got hit and it ran me right into the park bench. And unbeknownst to me, I had a cyst up under my heart. 
And when I hit that metal, I mean that, that cement abutment, this thing busted open inside of me. Now according to the doctors, this thing was about the size of a softball. And what it did was effectively poison my system. So I, I had to go from, from, from the park going up to the hospital. But in between that time, I had enough sense to understand that God is a healer. Somebody say amen. amen. I, understood, I understood the call that God had placed on my life even as a little bitty boy. Even though I didn't always walk the way that he wanted me to walk. But I knew that God had a call on my life. And uh, he had told me that he, that he had a call on my life. And yet here I was at 12 years old facing something that was, that would soon be death. And they performed the surgery, and, uh, but before the surgery was performed, I said, hey mom, I can remember before I, before I was uh, uh, taken in and given some stuff to knock me out, um, I said, hey mom, call that little bitty missionary woman down at the Church of God in Christ Church and have her pray for me. I knew that you could ask something of God, and this is what I want you to understand, when your heart is fixed, you can ask something from the Father God just like he's your earthly father. Amen? Amen. As an entitled child of his. And I ask that, that, that you have her pray for me so that I can get through this. I, and I never even thought about dying. And when, and when um, by the time she came up there, um, I was back in my room and I could see the priest on the side of the bed with a little black book and he opened it up and he began to read out of it giving me my last rites. I was in a coma. How could I see what was going on in that room if I'm in a coma? I wasn't in my body, I was above it. Looking down in the room of things that were going on in that room, my father was out in the hallway arguing with the doctor because he was so frustrated that his son was dying. And so they were having some choice words. I can remember my aunts and my uncles and some of my cousins that were in that were that were uh, uh, in the room immediately that they were crying and praying this and that. I remember telling my mom, and mom said, "How do you know that?" I said, "Mom, because I can see all of you." And I remember looking, looking up to my right and instantly I was caught up, caught up in the spirit. I don't, it's like being zapped. I was zapped into this, this uh, a tunnel-like area and it was brilliant light that was down at the other end, the far end of this tunnel. And there were thousands of people that were lined up walking toward the light. There was a strong pool that, 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 that pulls you toward the light. Now, I, it's hard to explain what, how that happens. Now, the best way that I can explain it, it's like a south pole and a negative pole of a magnet. They attract. The light was very, 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 very intense. And the glory of God, you could feel something as if, as if you had chills going through your body as you, as you walked. And I began to lean over so I could look up as far as I could see in the, up there toward the light. And I saw uh, a man standing, what I consider to be an entrance port of stepping into heaven. And he had a book that, was, that he had opened. And people would step up to him. And he would read from this, from this, from this book. And I noticed that some of the people were coming back the opposite direction. And everybody that was coming from the opposite direction were crying. And I, trying to figure out what is going on with that. But when I got up there, there was an overfeel, overflowing feel of, of uh, I've got to get out there where they are. I've got to get there. I've got to get there. And so I, I bypassed the man that was standing at the, at the port, port entrance, and I, that's the only way I know how to explain it. And I stepped out into what was some of the most prettiest green grass and browns and, and, 
and goldens and golden colors and blues and reds and yellow and people were praising and worshiping God. There was a tree of life that was standing in the middle and people were wrapped, were wrapped all around that tree. Thousands of people and there was praising and worshiping going on in that place. And I knew some of the people that were there. And, and it seemed like everybody that was there knew who I was. I don't know how to explain that, but they were all doing like this. Come on, come on, come on. About that time, as I started to take another step, the man grabbed me and said, son, you can't go in this place. You're going to have to go back. Your time is not now. There's a job yet for you to do. And I re-entered into my body just like that and came out of the coma. And the first words I said to my mother was, mom, is it over with? And the doctor came in the room and the priest dropped his book. Go figure. The doctor came in the room. He said, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. This man was dead. I pronounced him dead. And yet he's alive. The prayer of saints, this is why I want to say, that Barb had that type of heart that would pray. She was fixed in her heart. She knew who she was in Christ Jesus. She was established. It was a joy to be around her because of the workings of the Holy Spirit that was in her. You notice when you spend time with the Holy Spirit, you become very likable. <laughs> Well, so to get a heart fixed, there are three things we need to know. The word ruled mind is a mind that does not waver. It don't quit. It's a mind that's dominated by God's word. Thoughts and his natures. The third thing is the established fixed heart is a patient heart. You see, when you've done all that you can do, what do you do? Stand. Stand in what? Stand in faith. What do you stand with? The fact that God is powerful and that his strength is enough to sustain you. You stand knowing that, for, that God has opened up doors that nobody can close. Devil can be busy all around you, all that he wants to be. But God has the power to overpower him, to move him to the side, to step upon him. We are the head, not the tail. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Have patience. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So I encourage you this morning, don't relent. Barb, she didn't relent. She knew where she was going, and she was striving to get there. I'm asking you to strive this morning to take every bit of ounce of strength that you have to serve the Lord. Be a spokesman for the Lord. Be a witness in your home, on your jobs. Be a witness when you're around your friends and your neighbors. Don't turn back, don't get afraid. I say that because God is with you. You're not alone. Be constant yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen. This is what God is asking us to do. So how do you get a fixed heart? You've got to have fellowship with the Lord. You've got to be patient. You've got to have a, a handle on the word of God. Study to show yourself approved. Amen? Amen? And God will direct your pathways. Your life will find success in it. And the things that have been stumbling blocks to you will suddenly move off to the side because they now know you know who you are. Amen? Amen. God bless you.